we have now reached this point where we, like, I, I spent pretty much uh, two weeks or so trying to connect the relatively formal study of Gaussian process models, which are maybe the foundational type, archetype of supervised machine learning from the probabilistic perspective, generalizing that to a large chunk of contemporary machine learning in the form of deep learning in a particular way. And hopefully, last week's lecture made it clear to you that that's a worthwhile thing to do because it allows us to think about deep models from a perspective that a point estimation framework doesn't allow us to do. For example, to track changes in the model or in the data over time. For example, to heal certain pathologies in the model like its finite uncertainty far away from the data. And um, that, th this was sort of, like, maybe it would have been ideal to have that kind of lecture at the very beginning of the class so that it's sort of clear why we need to do this and why it's still useful to think about uncertainty in 2023. But it took a bit of time to get there, right? We needed to learn all these mechanisms and all this. We built it, we had to build this toolbox of linear algebra and algorithms and all this stuff to make stuff work. But now that we've done this, maybe we could take a step back and look more, again, at the foundational structure of probability theory and how we can make use of it to create interesting functionality. And the functionality I want to talk about for this week is how to deal with data that arrives across time. We already motivated that last Thursday because sometimes you're just in a setting where data arrives continuously and you want to sort of deal with it. So we saw in the very beginning of the class, first one, two, three, four lectures, that probabilistic inference in general can be, like in its general form, can be computationally quite taxing. And we have to think about the structure that we endow, uh, that we sort of impose on probability distributions to actually make inference possible. So today we're going to do this sort of spiel for time series problems, so problems where data arrives across time. And here's the plan. We're going to think about why it's even a problem to think about this kind of data. So where computational complexity actually arises in our inference models, our supervised machine learning problems, and why we cannot apply the models that we've used so far, including deep neural networks, out of the box to time series data. I'll talk a little bit about some examples for why you might want to care about uh, uh, data arriving in a stream, just very briefly, one slide. And then we'll take a, sort of a dive into the algebra and think about what we actually need, what kind of structure we need in a probability distribution to allow constant cost inference per time step. Because that's exactly what we need if you have an infinite stream of data. And then, as in the past, We'll first do this on the abstract level of what structure does a probability distribution need to have for it to even be in principle, in principle tractable. And then we'll realize that to make the local steps actually real, a real thing on our computer, we have to, again, make further choices. And this time, again, they will be Gaussian and linear algebra assumptions because they lead to closed form linear algebra updates. And I'll point out a few connections to other models as we go. Um, and that will lead to a type of algorithm that is called the Kalman filter. Raise your hand if you've heard of Kalman filters before. OK, and raise your hand if you feel that you can implement one and you know how to use it. OK, that's a small number, and it's going to simplify your homework. But for everyone else, you should do it, be able to do it after this exercise, after this lecture. So first step, I'm going to tell you something about how conditional independence affects computational complexity of inference. So that's our highest level we'll realize that if we just don't think about the structure of our model, it's potentially going to be very expensive to learn. And then we'll need to think about structure to make it possible to learn. So this harks back to lecture number two, when we had these graphical models, which since then have sort of fallen a little bit along the wayside. So you will remember I had this example with two coins and a bell taken from Stefan Hameling, where the bell rings whenever the two coins show the same side, heads or tails. We spoke about conditional independence and how it can be represented 
to some degree imperfectly by pictures like this, directed graphical models. And we realized that if you just have two variables, there isn't much to talk about in terms of independence. Two variables are always either independent or dependent, and that's a bit boring. But when you have three variables, there is interesting structure called conditional independence. Because the conditional distribution of the other two variables, given one of them, can become independent or stay dependent or become dependent if it previously was independent. So we had these, these atomic structures called a chain, a fan out, and a fan in, or a V structure, or a collider. There are different words for it. Well, and we discovered that if we write down graphs like this, so these, remember these, uh, these, these graphs are a graphical representation of a factorization structure. We draw these graphs um, to represent a joint probability distribution by first drawing one circle with a variable name in it for each variable, and then looking at a representation of this joint distribution as a factorization into terms and drawing an arrow for every such factor from all the variables on the right-hand side to all the variables on the left-hand side of this conditional distribution. So for a joint, for a general distribution, um, if, you, if you don't know anything further, if there's, if there's no further structure known, then the product rule of probability theory only says that P of A, B, and C is P of A given B of C, B and C times P of B given C. And that's a fully connected graph where every node has either an incoming or an outcoming arrow um, to every other node. And then there is nothing further to say because everything could depend on everything and then things are boring. But sometimes we know that we can drop certain terms. So for example, this is a simplification, right? Because there is no A here in this factor. And we had an example of such structures with this, you know, the alarm and the burglar from Judea Pearl, sort of classic textbook examples. And we noticed that um, these different types of structures lead to different conditional independent structure. In this graph, if we uh, marginalize out B, then A and C are marginally dependent on each other. But when we condition on B, they become independent of each other. And in this graph, marginally A and C are independent of each other, but when we condition on B, they become dependent on each other. This is called explaining away sometimes, or induced dependence. So back then, maybe that structure was a bit abstract. It's like, why do we care about this? And now it's like, you know, half a year later almost. This sort of, we almost forgot about this. But actually, it was always with us during the entire last few weeks. It's just that the models we looked at were much more complicated. And so this simple atomic structure was maybe not always so easy to see. So the first type of models that we looked at were these parametric regression models. So we, have, we are trying to learn a function, f of x, which we observe with noise. So the y's are noisy observations of f evaluated at some point. And we made this assumption that we can write the function as a finite set of feature functions of x times a finite set of weights. I actually wrote the corresponding graph back then more suggestively that it, to, to make it look more like a, like a neural network, like a shallow neural network with just one actual layer. I mean, actually two layer, but the, the input layer was just predetermined and not uncertain. So that, yeah, sort of, we can forget about it. Um, but here's another way of writing it as a graph that maybe makes the conditional dependence independent structure a bit clearer. We have these unknown weights. So that's why this is an empty circle, because it's unknown. And we think that through the feature functions, one, two, three, four, of the axis, we can create the value of the function at all of these four points and then make noisy observations. Remember that observations are filled in circles in black. So this is an example of this kind of fan out structure. If we knew what the weights were, we could independently predict the observations. And that's actually the structure we use in the likelihood to make computation in some sense easier. This is, you may remember, or maybe you can think about it for a few moments while I keep talking, that this was the reason why something like, like stochastic gradient descent is possible in deep learning. 
because it, it means that we can draw batches of individual Ys and consider them independently to learn about W without having to think about the other Ys in the data set. It's also um, something that affects the computational complexity of the, the algorithm. A phone? So has anyone found a phone somewhere in your, uh, around you? It's not here either. No? Can you try, maybe ask the housemaster? Just right next to the entrance. They might have found it. All right, uh, let's come back to computation complexity. Get away from phones. Um, so we, the, another aspect of this graph is that it, um, we, it also means that there is some kind of finite object, W, that we can keep track of, and it describes everything we think we need to know. Not everything we need to know, but everything we think we need to know. It's a finite dimensional representation of the problem. And that's why we can, in this case, work in the space, in the, on the, uh, like the so-called weight space, so the probability distribution on the weights, and represent the entire problem this way. We did this with the Laplace approximation by building this covariance matrix that is constructed from the Hessian of the loss function. And you may remember that constructing that matrix is linear in the number of observations y. So it's linear in this set. It's cubic in the size of the weight space, at worst case, but linear in the number of observations. We also had this other type of model called a generic Gaussian process model, a non-parametric model, a model in which we directly work in the space of function values without assuming a finite latent representation of the function values. In some sense, as we saw, this is a more powerful representation because it's effectively infinitely flexible. You can learn any function. That's also the reason why infinitely wide neural networks can learn any function because they are effectively Gaussian processes. But the price we paid for that is that there is no such finite latent representation. This graph between the function values is fully connected. If we want to write down the conditional probability distribution of one of those variables, given all the other ones, we have to really think about all the other ones. And you may remember that for Gaussian distributions, we can read off the conditional probability distribution of one variable given the other ones from the precision matrix, from the inverse covariance matrix. So that's why I've sort of written down these terms in the matrix. So if this matrix is dense, which it is in general for general Gaussian process models, then the, this graph is fully connected, at least in F. I mean, the Ys are conditionally independent. That's sort of our assumption in the likelihood, but that doesn't really help us much because the latent variables are fully dependent on each other. So that still means that we, you know, we could, we could go like, collect batches of the data set somehow and then compute gradients, but the gradients would have to be with respect to all of the latent function values. And so inference is going to be cubic, not in the size of some latent object, but cubic in the number of observations we've made, because there is no latent object. And that's bad if we have data that keeps arriving here on the right. So if there is finitely many Ys, well, I mean, cubic complexity is uh, still not something you want to do with a very large data set. It's, uh, if you have more than, I don't know, 10,000 data points, you will need to think about how to make things faster. But if you now sort of put yourself in the you know, perspective of a theoretical computer scientist, then it's a polynomial time algorithm, right? So it's kind of you know, tractable. But what if n, the number of observations, rises without bound? If we just sit somewhere and we keep getting data in all the time, 
then we will need an algorithm that has linear complexity in the number of data points. Why linear? Does someone have an idea? This. It's the absolute lower bound if you have new data all the time. Yeah, in the sense that that means that every individual time step is O of 1, constant cost, right? And that's exactly what we need. Because if it keeps growing, then eventually, as n gets arbitrarily large, the computational complexity of one individual step will be arbitrarily high. And we can't do that anymore, right? So no matter what your hardware is, we will eventually run out of hardware. So that's sort of the, the worst we could, we could possibly accept. And of course, there could also be an O of 1 algorithm, but that would mean we never touch most of the data set, right? So that's also not really feasible. So we kind of need O of n from below, in a sense, right? Because if, we, if it's, if it's ch cheaper than O of n, then at least if we're thinking of serial processing, then that, that means we're not touching a particular part of the data set. That, that's bad. We're missing some of the data. And if it's more than O of n, then we will eventually run out of computational um, resources. And that's not going to work either, at least in the assumption that data arrives across time all the time. And that is actually the case in some applications. So if you are collecting sensor readings through time, for example, for weather and climate modeling, or if you're building a, a self-driving car that drives around and keeps seeing the world around it, or uh, in medical applications where you, know, you might attach some sensors to a patient and read off their uh, vital signs, or many other kind of settings where things typically change across time, we need to be able to deal with this continuous accumulation of computational uh, tasks to make them tractable. And so usually people think of, because of this kind of connection between computational complexity and runtime, we tend to think of these problems where we need this structure as time structure problems. So maybe more generally, we could say you can think of one-dimensional problems in an ordered space that just, we just move along that space in an arbitrary direction. But of course, in pretty much all real-world applications, that direction is time. And therefore, these types of models or problems are called time series. So for our purposes, a time series is a sequence of observations indexed by some scalar variable. So that means it has an ordered space. And uh, what we often have is that the time steps are a constant, so that there's sort of a, a regular frequency at which we sample data, for example, because that's how your sensors work or because that's how you decide to make the, the, the poll to your system. That simplifies things a little bit, because then we can just think of indices of observations um, as um, integers, right, as natural numbers, and um, that uh, then simplify some of the, say, the exposition that we're going to talk about today. So on Thursday, Nathanael Bosch will take over for one day because I'm not in Tübingen and uh, maybe give you an idea of what we do if the time steps are not constant. Yeah. So I guess it's like from this slide should be clear that these are the types of models that we should care about, right? Some, some nodding? Huh? And mostly, I feel like there has to be a slide like this just to say that this is important. But yeah, it's also just to set the scene. Maybe one interesting thing to note about such univariate spaces. So that, by definition, I've said this ti comes from a scalar variable. So scalar variables are univariate. One interesting aspect of the univariate, both continuum and also the row of integers, is that they are ordered. So we know whether something is before or after some other stuff. And that's actually going to be extremely useful because it will give us a sense of direction to move through the data from one end to the next. So in such systems, in such problems, we need to achieve computational complexity of order n and we saw that we can't, well, okay, so maybe we saw that one way to do this, actually, 
the one example we had so far where this would work is this. So in this parametric regression setting, it's actually possible to keep updating a model by putting in one data point after the other. And we did this a few times. We did it when we, when we spoke about parametric regression in the first place. We saw we, have this, we, had, we actually wrote this piece of code called Gaussians.py that has a function called condition, which for the weight space, just for weight space inference, just returns another Gaussian. And then we can keep that and condition it again on the next data point, and so on and so on. And because the object that we're operating on is the mean vector and the covariance matrix of the associated Gaussian distribution, that's a finite object that we can hand around through time. We did this again when we talked about how the linear algebra methods that do Gaussian process inference actually work. We realized that the Cholesky decomposition is effect effectively a bookkeeping process that goes through the data set one after the other in some arbitrary ordering. And at each point, keeps the conditional distribution of the weights given all the previous data points. So the conditional distribution of W given all of the Ys up to a certain point, and then updates them with one new data point. And that update, it turned out, is quadratically expensive in um, the weight space. And therefore, since we have to do it for the, and actually, it's cubic expensive in the weight space, sorry. So for the non-parametric model, it's quadratically expensive, but then we have to do it n times, so that's cubically expensive. And we did it a final time last Thursday, where I said, we had this example of this permuted MNIST setup. You, you keep getting new data, and you'd like to make sure that your model loads all of the data. Right? And then your question actually came up and said, well, but if your model is, is not extremely overparameterized, even given all of the data, not just one data set, but all of the incoming data, shouldn't it eventually become sort of overconstrained and stiff and not be able to learn anymore new data? And that's true. So in this setting, because this conditional distribution assumes that W is a constant object that is not changing across time, if we keep getting more and more and more data, we will just become more and more and more confident about W. And if we actually think that that's the case, then that's the correct thing to do. So if there's a description of the world that does not change, for example, you know, the, like, I, mean, I guess all laws of nature would have this property. So if we, at least we would like it, them to have this property. So assuming that uh, Newtonian mechanics don't change, then we could learn Newtonian mechanics in this way. Or if W is the set of cosmological constants, you know, the sort of this finite set of things that describe the world, then maybe we could learn them in this way. But if we are thinking of a, of a task where the problem changes as we move, we need something else. No matter whether the thing that, we, that the model we're going to talk about is some tiny little sensor reading somewhere in the airbag of your car that has to be on, done on a chip that will cost I don't know, 50 cents, or whether it's a deep neural network that uh, you have to hand around in your organization and it has to work on a huge data stream that keeps coming in. These are all of the same type, a setting where we have to keep track of something that changes across time. But that thing which we would like to like keep track of and like see change across time will nevertheless have to be something finite. And it'll have to be something that does not grow as we get more data. Because if it does, then, well, we won't have O of N inference, right? And the cost of each step will keep growing all the time. Does that make sense? So the, the object that we're going to hand around is we could think of it as some memory, as some finite thing that we hand from one time step to the next. Sometimes that's also associated with the word state that gets moved from one time to the next. 
And there's various reasons why the word state shows up. Um, there is a physical reason. So physicists tend to think of, they use the word state as designating that uh, it provides a full description of a system. So in physics, the state of a system is a description in terms of variables that fully identify the system so that you can predict its behavior into the future. That's the sort of uh, Cartesian view of the world. Determinism, if you only knew what the state of the world were of the entire universe at some point in, the, in, in time, then you could predict the entire world forward. But there's also a kind of computer science-y um, interpretation of the word state. So if you've taken the theory of computer science class, maybe even by myself, you've heard about finite um, automata, which are state machines, right? They have a finite set of states, and then a rule for how the system changes from one state to the next, given some input from the world. And uh, in this, um, well, I'm gonna show you the next picture, right? You could think of something like this, where the world moves on, and at every time step, the world provides an observation, and that somehow does something to the state. Your state changes according to some rule. It's just that that change doesn't necessarily have to be deterministic. So for finite automata, that change is deterministic, um, but you could imagine a setting where it's, I'm not gonna use the word non-deterministic because that has a technical meaning in theoretical computer science, but stochastic, maybe. Yeah, and that leads us to these kind of models, to the following idea. We're going to assume that function values that we observe across time are represented by this graph. That's a first way of thinking about this. That's maybe a way to get into this thought process. We, we had, and sorry that I keep, no, I'm not gonna jump around. I'm just gonna say it and wave my hand around except instead of hopping to the previous slides. So we had this early slide with the different atomic structures of graphs. We saw that there is one type of graph called a chain graph. This is a chain graph, which has the property that the left side of the graph is independent from the right side of the graph when we condition on the variable between them. So in particular, in this graph, these two variables are independent of this variable when we condition on this variable. Or these two variables are independent of this variable when we condition on this variable. And conditioning means that we write down what we know about this variable or whatever variable we try to condition on. So that means we build a probability distribution over it and then marginalize out when we predict. Another way of thinking about this, uh, about what this might mean for our Gaussian probability distributions, but that's not something that will like, make, help us particularly far, but maybe just for intuition for what this means relative to the distributions we've looked at so far, is that we're looking for Gaussian probability distributions where the inverse covariance matrix, the precision matrix, has lots of zeros on the off diagonals. Why? Because on a previous slide, I showed you that you can think of these zeros on the off diagonal as the arrows or the presence the, or the absence of arrows from other variables onto, like across their direct neighbors. And one reason to anticipate why this might be a good thing to do is that you may have heard, or maybe the fact that this works implies, the other way around, if you haven't heard about it yet, that there are fast algorithms for solving such types of linear problems. So in Gaussian inference, right, we're going to need to compute this thing times a vector. And you can imagine that that's, there is an O of N way of doing this that involves spec substitution or maybe just, you know, m multiplying things indirectly. Because there is also clearly only O of N numbers in this matrix. In this case, not even quite 2n, just n plus n minus 1 for the off-diagonal. So what we need is conditional independent structure. And 
Models like this that have this chain structure are also called Markov chains. After this guy, Andrei Andreevich Markov, uh, or Makuf, probably. Well, uh, any Russian speakers in the room? Hmm. Yes. Ah, OK, so maybe it's Russian Empire. Ah. Ah, OK, I need to read up on him. So my, he did write this text. Oh, Kazan. So maybe, ah, OK, so it's probably somewhere sort of eastern, southeastern. Ah, maybe I have to read up on, on him. So he did present this work that this is all named after to a, well, <clears throat> a society for physics and mathematics at Kazan University, which at that point, at least, I think was part of the Russian Empire, 1906. That's my understanding. And the reason why I have this understanding is that um, this text is only available, at least it was for a long time, in this form, which I assume is Russian, because <laughs> I can't read it. And we know about it in the West thanks to this guy, Gorov who read it and then actually mentioned it in the Grundbegriffe uh, der Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung in 1933, and also had a second text in which he pointed out that this was a very important result. He said he sort of relayed uh, the insight of Markov to say this is something we should really study because it's a very interesting structure to use. Why is it an interesting structure? He actually writes here in the original German because it's the first kind of relaxation of independence. So this is sort of the other way of approaching this problem. So, so far in our course, we've gotten used to everything being dependent on everything because those are powerful models, right? Then we can do this in 2023 because we have powerful computers. We can think about what we would do if everything depends on everything. But in 1933 or 1905, People couldn't invert matrices with a, with a million entries. And they didn't have you know, gigabytes of memory available. What they could think of were things that were completely independent of each other. And then you can just sum up those independent things and keep them completely separate. But Ramagorov already realizes that this is basically a little bit too boring, right? If everything is independent of each other, there's no interaction with each other. And he even writes that you know, this, this whole thing, this whole uncertain, uh, sorry, independence, independence really is the, like, well, the Begriff, which the Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung your eigenartiges Gepräge gibt. Like this thing that makes probability theory so complicated. It's not the fact that we compute conditional distributions and marginal distributions. It's not Bayes' theorem. It's not the fact that there's a prior and a likelihood. These are just the natural rules that arrive from keeping track of measures. So when you, when you correctly treat measures in the right way, so that in particular we're not accidentally losing or adding measure as we operate, then, so that's the idea of probability theory, right? Conserving measure during operations. Then um, those rules just, they are just completely natural. There's no other way to define them. But independence is actually the weak, sort of the Achilles heel of this entire process. Because it kind of assumes that things just completely happen fully separated from each other in a world where we can never really be sure that they are fully separated from each other. And if you want to look in your master thesis or whatever you want to do afterwards for like one of the deepest questions you could possibly ask, it's probably one of these. So the people who work on foundations of probability theory there are even some here in Tübingen, for example, in Bob Williamson's group, they still sort of deal with this fundamental problem of independence. It also, by the way, is inherited by everything related to causality. There's a corresponding problem in causality that it seems weird to assume that the, the set of causes of some event is somehow finite and restricted to a particular actual set of causes. Similarly to how it's sort of a bit dangerous to assume that there is a finite object, a set of variables, such that if we know those variables, everything else becomes independent of each other. This also translates into physics, right? in the questions of what quantum theory actually says and whether there's randomness or not. A lot of the questions boil down to these particular issues of whether 
there is a finite representation that separates things from each other or not, local or non-local. And so Kamagorov says, if we want to consider something where things are not quite fully independent, the first thing we could do is this kind of, kind of conditional independence structure given a local set of variables called the state of the system. And that gives natural rise to, ah, uh, yeah, so here, actually, he's, uh -huh, now I should have showed this slide a bit earlier. This gives natural rise to the idea of Markov chains. So that was the high level part of this lecture. And now, before we go into the break, let me set up some notation so that you can stare at it if you like during the break. Um, actually, should I do that? Maybe it's better to leave you with the philosophy. Um, yeah, how about we just, I just leave this up? It's because it's a much more nice thing to go into the break with, right? So if you want to think about something big during the break, wonder whether things are ever actually fully independent, whether you think there is a set of variables such that if you knew them, everything else was just random. Right? And we will talk, uh, we will continue this conversation in a much more mathematical sense at uh, 5 past 11. So um, someone pointed out that I managed to mistype the name Kalmogorov on those two slides. I've just now fixed it. Sorry about that. That happens when you actually type the name quickly. Um, it's now corrected. So now, with the big philosophy out of the way, as always, we'll need to dive in and actually do the math. And to do that, I just want to be explicit that I'm now going to change notation um, to make it more germane with the typical notation in these classes of models. So, so far in this class, we've um, tended to, uh, what well, we, we thought in terms, of, in terms of a latent function f in the regression setting, where there is a bunch of x's inputs, and we get to evaluate the function f of x, and then we see why. And this kind of made sense in this sort of axis coordinate type space where there's like x's inputs and y's outputs. But now we're, we're sort of, we have this third object called the state, the latent representation. And those used to be the weights, but there was only just one set of weights. And weights maybe is the wrong word. So we're going to change the notation. And this is a notation that comes more from, for example, the signal processing community, the people who deal with sensors. Um, and maybe also the physicists who work with these dynamical systems or applied mathematicians who do dynamical systems. Namely, we're now going to assume that there is this latent state of the world and we're going to use the variable x to denote that state. So x is not an input to a function anymore. At least that's not the first way to think about it. It's a representation of the world, the latent thing. And then there is a set of observations, which we call y, which we make at a sequence of instances of x. And so we need another variable to, to index where we are in this one-dimensional space along which things change. And because of the natural connection to the notion of time, we're going to use the variable t to denote this one-dimensional space. So there is now a chain of x's at time t of which we make a somehow corrupted observation called y at time t. And because we assume that there are, that we only measure at discrete intervals with, at least for today, a constant step between the different intervals, we could also index the time by t1 all the way through tn. And sometimes I'm just going to drop the t and just think of xi from 1 to n, or sometimes also yeah, 1 to capital T. So there is usually some kind of confusion about whether the index is over time or over natural numbers. For today, that won't actually matter so much because I'm just going to assume 
that the time step between them is constant, and then it's just an integer index. And on Thursday, Nathanael will have to deal with the, what happens if the distance between time steps varies. So the question is about, about this h. So um, here, this is still the row about regression, right? So in regression, we assume for full generality that we're making linear observations, affine projections of the function, and then add some Gaussian noise. So the little curly approximately equals here is supposed to mean that there is some noise involved, some probability distribution, typically Gaussian noise. And in regression, we realize that actually, I mean, we typically assume that we just evaluate f at some point. But actually, we could more generally uh, evaluate any linear projection of f, because then the framework still works. For example, you could evaluate the, gradi uh, the, the derivative, the gradient of a function f, or even integrals or whatever, right? or just subsets of it. Here now, um, we are typically going to assume that we make linear observations of x. And here, this is now maybe a little bit more important. So I'm um, using the variable h for this. Because if we actually see all of the states x, that's maybe a, like a boring base case. Like an interesting situation might arise if we only get to see certain parts of x. So if y has a lower dimensionality than x, and then h is going to be a rectangular matrix. By the way, not only x and y and t are the canonical names for these variables, but from now on, all, everything I'm going to show you for the rest of this, of this lecture is super standardized notation. So the fact that I use h here is not a random decision by myself, but it's an absolutely standard thing. And the reason for this is that it comes from engineers. So signal processing is an engineering discipline, and engineers are very precise with their notation so that they can nail it down once, and then they never have to think about the math again. They can just use the notation. So if I use the variables a and h and q and r, then a signal processing engineer will immediately know what I talk about. And it's not just a random choice of variables. So I'll mention this a few more times. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make the observation abstractly that if we assume that our joint distribution over the latent variables has this form, then things get easy. So first of all, what does this form mean? So this is the simple math representation of this chain graph. Right? So on previous slides, I had this graph with circles and then just one set of arrows going through. That graph corresponds to this expression for the axis, at least for the relationships of the axis. The y's, I haven't written down yet. Why? Because it means that when we want to predict the i-th state, given all the previous ones, that is equal to the i state given just the previous one. What does this mean? It means conditional independence. It means that i, xi, is independent of all the x, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, when conditioned on its direct predecessor, xi minus 1. Yes? No, we, will not, we do not want to learn h. We want to learn x. This is exactly the point. The thing we care about now is x. So in regression, we were given x because it was the input to a function. Now the input to the function is t, time. And we wanted to learn a function, which we could have represented by a finite set of weights. But now there is a changing set of, of things that affect the world, and we call those x. And I know that this is confusing. The problem is if I didn't do it, it would be even more confusing, because the entire notation in this field is in this form. So if you pick up any textbook, you're going to see this notation. And so we just have to make this switch now. So x is the state. It's the thing that we care about, that we would like to learn. When uh, a joint distribution has this property, we call this the Markov property. Because it means that things become independent when you know the latent state. And now we're going to observe that when we have this structure, there is a class of algorithms which are O of n which allow inference in uh, linear time. And this works. There's a little bit of a subtlety to it, which we'll find, which is that 
if you want to go through the data set one after the other and observe one datum after the other and always keep a local estimate of what the state x is, then that can be done in a single path through the data from left to right, if you like. And that's called filtering. It just is called filtering. And don't ask me why. Now, there's a bit of a complication that if we have gone through the whole data set and we are at the end, whatever we might, we might want to call the end, then later observations also tell us something about what previous state values could have been. They are not completely useless. And if we want to make a statement afterwards about previous states that is consistent with our current estimate of the last state, then we have to do a final step back through the data set all the way to the front, but only once, and then we're done, and everything is fine. And that backward pass through the data is called smoothing. And I say forward and backward because also this algorithm is sometimes called the forward-backward algorithm. But this is not related to autodiff and to backward passes in deep learning. Well, at least not superficially. So you can switch off your back pa backward pass and backprop ideas for a moment. This is message passing. Just it, and OK, if you really care about it, yes, there is a relationship, and they're not completely separate concepts. But this is not the time to think about it. So, and for that, I now need you to bear with me for three slides in which we're going to do some nasty math. So nasty that I had to reduce the font size. So up here, you see the, our graph. This is the assumption we make about the generative model of what's going on. So we are moving through time from left to right. At every time, time step, we potentially make an observation called y. We would like to know what the latent state of the world x is. For example, what are the weights of my neural network that I currently need to use to predict? For example, where is the position of the car relative to the outside world? For example, what are the kinematic state of the robots that I'm trying to control? And so on and so on. We make two assumptions, those two. Namely, the important one, the Markov property, that the state at time t given, is independent of all the previous um, states when conditioned on the immediate predecessor. Well, this notation here is the slicing notation that means all the x's from 0 all the way to t minus 1, just like in Python. Yeah, I'm going to use capital X to say the collection of all the x's through time indexed in this slicing notation from 0 to t minus 1 where, some maybe annoyingly, um, I'm using t minus 1 to mean and including t minus 1. So in Python, it would be up to t, t minus 2. But I actually always thought that that's a dangerous choice to make in the notation. It seems more natural to say those are included. And the second observation is this conditional independence of the observation that you can see in the graph. So that the fact that there are no arrows pointing from all the x's to all the y's means that we assume that the observations are local as well. They are local observations of the state, effectively. This is a less novel assumption. We've actually already always made it uh, in previous applications as well. It's just a likelihood factorizes. So now, if these two are true, these are like axioms of our model, now we're just going to see where they, where they get us, where they lead us to. And that involves these three lines of annoying math. And the key thing here now is that we're not going to make any further assumptions about what p actually is. We're just saying there is a probability distribution which has this property. It just factorizes. And the x's could be a vector of real numbers. It could be discrete val values, variables, anything. It's just a probability distribution over variables, x and y. Now. Assume the following setting. We have this data set in front of us, the world with its time series, and we keep getting observations. And our task for a moment is to predict 
the state at time t, given everything we've seen so far, up to the previous observation y t minus 1. We have not made our observation at time t yet, but we're currently at t. We've seen all the ones to t minus 1. So what we're interested in is this posterior distribution, which in particular is a conditional distribution, for x at time t, given all the previous y's. So first of all, we are going to write this down as an instance of Bayes' theorem. So you remember that Bayes' theorem is the, prob the joint probability of everything here, x and um, y, all the way to t minus 1, divided by the marginal probability for the observations for everything that's on the right-hand side here. But we're not just going to do that. We're actually going to expand even further by adding in all the previous x's as well, and the later x's, all the x's, all of them. And we can do that using the product rule. Or actually, sorry, the sum rule of probability theory. So we just we sort of do it reversely. We just add variables and then say we could have integrated those out to get this distribution over x of t given all the previous y's. So this up here is an expression for p of x t times p of all the y's given x t. And then we extend with all the other x's as well. And why do we need to do that? Well, because all the other x's are needed to explain what the y's are. Right? We need to put them in. OK? Oh, I already lost you. Oh, I've already lost many of you. So let me maybe see. We could have written, uh, so we need p of xt given all the y's from 0 to t minus 1. We could first write, that's p of xt times p of all the y's from 0 to t minus 1 given xt divided by p of y from 0 to t minus 1, right? So in particular, this is also uh, p of all the x's, including t, times p of y, 0, t minus 1, all the x's. But we integrate out all the x's that are not like j not t divided by, well, p of y. So p of y, we can also expand like this. So it's the integral over p of y given x times p of x, and the y again goes from 0 to t minus 1, over all the x's. No, no not equal to, just all the x's, because they all get, to integrate, get integrated out, right? OK. That's the first step. The next step is to explicitly write out the joint distribution over all the y's and all the x's. So let's first think about this term, all the p of x's. So the joint distribution, we could, in a general probability distribution, we could write it as p of x0 times p of x1 given x0 times p of x2 given x1 and x0 times p of x3 given x2 and x1 and x0 and so on, right? But here, because we have this chain graph, we can drop all these previous ones. So that's where we use our first axiom. So we get p of x0 times a product over all times from 0 to t, p of xj given xj minus 1. And then all the later t's as well, they are back here. If you can see it, it's in green. For all the larger times, larger than, than t, p of xj given xj minus 1. It's just an ordering of these terms to make them move them at the right point in the product. It's a product, so it's commutative. We just move things around. Same thing for the y's. So we have this assumption that the y's are conditionally independent given their parents, xt. So this term, all the y's given x, factorizes into a bunch of terms y0 given x0. And then in the same product as before, all of the yj's given just the local xj and not the other x's. 
And there is no y yet in the future, so back here there is no y terms. So far we haven't seen any future y's. And we do the same thing in the denominator because it's the same expression. The integral is just over a different set of variables. So we just can literally copy paste from above. And just keep in mind that we're integrating out one more variable. Next step. So now we realize, first of all, that these terms back here, these integrals, these green ones, they are over an xj where that xj doesn't show up anywhere else. Right? Here, this entire thing does not contain a j larger than t. So it's just an integral over a probability distribution. And an integral over a probability distribution is just 1. So there's just lots and lots and lots of 1s back here, both, at the, both in, in the numerator and the denominator. So we can just forget about those. They're already gone. The green stuff is gone in the next slide. Now um, let's look at the front part. So here we realize that actually in the top and the bottom, a lot of things are the same. There's only one difference, and that's to do with this j unequal to t bit. So in the, at the point where j is equal to t, we have this extra thing, this extra factor here in here, uh, actually here, here it is, that gets integrated out at the bottom. And it gets actually integrated out because there is no yt yet. So this is just a probability distribution. So it just integrates to 1. But up here, we can't do this yet because um, xt is not actually integrated over, right? It's that there's, this is not in the integration set. So we have to keep this separately here in front, move it, to the, so that we move it separately to the front, and then we are left with an integral over all j less than t. And down here as well, it's just that at the top and the bottom, there is one extra factor here in, with a t minus 1 inside. So this is a function of t minus 1 as well. And therefore, we can't just do the integral directly. But for all the other ones, um, the terms are the same. And we can think about what they actually mean. So up here, this is effectively a p of x t minus 1 times p of all the y's up to t minus 1 given t minus 1 divided by, well, all of the, like, p of all the y's, basically, up to t minus 1. Because we integrate out all the x's. So that's, I mean, down here, I've left it once explicitly, but it's really just the joint distribution over everything that isn't xt integrated against all the x's, so the y's are left. So this is actually an instance of Bayes' theorem as well. It's a p of x, p of all the y's given xt minus 1 times p of xt minus 1 divided by p of all the y's. So it's, a, it's the previous posterior, sort of. It's, sort of the, it's p of xt minus 1 given all of the y's. And then there's a single integral left that we can't do which is, well, at least not yet, that we can't get rid of, that we have to sort of keep around to actually think about, which is this local integral of this form. So what this entire derivation tells us is we can build a recursive inference structure where to compute the predictive distribution for xt, given all of the previous data, we first do inference on xt minus 1 from all the previous data, and then do this, whatever this requires us to do. So this is a problem that we haven't solved yet, but it's a much smaller integral, right? It's a single integral over this latent state at the last time. And because we assume that this latent state is somehow finite and it's something we carry around, maybe this is something we can do. Ex actually, explicitly do. There's another way to think about this. I could have also waved my hands around and said, well, there's this graph up there. You know, you can think about it, right? If I give you all of the previous y's, then the only way they interact with xt is through the previous xt minus 1. So therefore, you know, I could first operate on that and compute this thing. By the way, I have a slide for this, right? Yeah, you could have just, you know, that, well, the joint distribution of xt and xt minus 1, given all the previous y's, could be factorized in this way. So we, you know, we take xt minus 1 um, here to the left times, so this is a product rule. 
Um, and that just works because of the graph, but it's a bit hand wavy, right? It's just yeah, because of the graph, because of independence. So what I just showed you on the previous slide is the actual explicit derivation to show that the graph is a correct representation of this, this kind of behavior. And then this gives us exactly the object that we care about. And this equation is called the chapman komorov equation. And this is another instance of uh, Western, Eastern, Divan type uh, Cold War situation where two people come up with similar ideas but, uh, on different sides of the Iron Curtain. So this is the first part of our, what, is, what is going to become our general purpose inference scheme for time series, which is if you're currently at time t, you've dealt with all that data up to t minus 1, to get ready to observe yt, you need to solve this equation, which is a local computation involving what you currently know about the local state. That's why it's so important. It actually represents this idea of a local state. It says you can deal with the entire past by only keeping track of the pre pre predecessor state. So now comes the next step, and the next step is actually much easier. It's, oh, I need to make an observation. Let's observe yt. So to observe yt, so the change from the previous slide is that there is now a all the way up to t. So this is y up to t minus 1 plus yt. Well, we just do Bayesian inference. So it's a local observation, and loca local stuff is going to be typically tractable. So we just, we have from the, from the previous slide our local prior, you could call it, for xt, given all the previous observations. Now we just multiply with the likelihood for the local observation. Because of this assumption, we can get rid of all of the other x's, right, and directly write it in this likelihood. There's nothing, we already integrated everything out, basically. Um, normalize, and that's just Bayesian inference. Oops, uh, right? And uh, so I'm not going to write more down than that. It's, it's, you just have to do this, but it only involves an integral over the local xt. So hopefully, we're able to do that. So that means we now have two out of three important steps. We're able to start with the data, move all the way to time t, deal with the past, make a local observation at time t, and now we could actually run this thing forward through time. We could keep doing this, make a prediction, chapman kolmogorov make an observation, Bayes' theorem. Make a prediction, chapman kolmogorov make an observation, Bayes' theorem. And those two steps only involve local computations, so they only involve an integral over something called dxt, or dxt minus 1. So those are integrals that we might hope to be able to do. And we could do that all the way to the end. So now, let's say at some point our time series actually ends, and we're done. Or we just call it a day, basically. The time series continues, but we just say, OK, that's enough for now. Now there's a bit of a complication, which is that the things we've computed so far are always just x of t's given the previous data. So if we, could, if we would have kept those in memory, we would have had, had to have a memory that keeps linearly growing, but we could have done that, right? We just keep storing all the stuff that we've done so far. Then those probability distributions that we've stored there, these p of xt given y all the way to t, they are now sort of deprecated, right? They are kind of outdated. Why? Because they do not take into account that later on we got to see more data. So to make them consistent with the later data, we want actually to compute this thing on the top left, p of xt given all the y's, not just the ones all the way to t. And for that, we now do this bit, which I'll do a little bit faster, um, which will turn out to be this process where we go effectively from the end of the data stream backwards through time to correct the uh, predictions we've made in light of later experience. And it works like this. We first introduce again another variable using the sum rule. And why do we do that? Well, because we kind of have this intuition that the only way that later data provides information to us 
is through the immediate successor in the chain. So let's maybe put that in and see if it helps us anything. Now we use the uh, product rule. So we move this to the, we write this distribution, which is also a distribution over xt plus 1 in particular, as a conditional distribution plus a marginal distribution, eh, plus times a marginal distribution. And now I've colored this in green because this is the bit we now, uh, sorry, the, the blue, this is blue and green. Maybe, can you see this? This is blue, this is green, just barely. This projector is not so great because this blue bit is something we now need to look at for a bit. So what, the, what does this mean? This is what we learn about xt when conditioning on xt plus 1 and all the y's. And we can probably sort of imagine what it's going to be. You can already see it if you sort of peek ahead down here. What we're going to see is this by conditioning on the future state xt plus 1, the successor state, we can kind of get rid of all of the future observations in this term. So the only way information flows to xt is through xt plus 1. And xt plus 1 will kind of represent everything we've learned from the later data. And we actually do this in this row. So we take this blue bit, write it here, expand to write it with base theorem again. So we write this as a sort of likelihood for all the future y's given xt plus 1 and all the earlier y's and xt with a prior with normalization constant below, and then use the factorization property to realize that those future t's are independent, uh, sorry, the future y's are independent of, of xt when conditioned on xt plus 1, and stare at this for a while to realize that those two cancel out and we're left with, well, bits in here cancel out and we're left with an essentially, uh, well, something that only depends on the, the initial data all the way to t and xt plus 1 and not the future data. So then this blue bit we can plug in here. So we can simplify this term and just drop all the future y's. I've copied this bit here. It's still blue because it's the same thing, right? All, all the blue bits are the same, exact same object. And um, then actually, uh, does it make sense to, well, okay. So by now it sort of maybe becomes a bit more mechanical. So we look at this object, we realize that if we can write it as a conditional probability distribution, um, so we sort of had an instance of Bayes theorem if you like, or the product rule if you like, and um, rearrange again into a likelihood and what you might call sort of a prior. And notice again conditional independence. So all the future xt plus 1 are independent of the past y's given xt. So we can drop all the y's here in this bit. And we're left with this sort of expression, which we can now plug into up here, because we realize that the blue thing is equal to this expression. And if you plug it in here, we get this, which tells us that p of xt given all y's is the thing that we computed in the previous step, the red bit. So that's the bit we got from moving from left to right through the data, times a correction, which involves how you would predict xt plus 1 from xt and a sort of ratio between what we knew about xt plus 1 after having seen all the data versus what we saw previously from the earlier data. So this is some, sometimes this is called, uh, also called a cavity distribution. It's sort of the full thing that we have computed in the, in the previous step coming backwards. So in, as the algorithm runs, we are computing x like p of xt plus 1 given all of the y's. That's the green bit. And we have maybe stored what we've previously predicted, xt plus 1 given all of the y's all the way to t. And we well, divide those two distributions by each other. Well, so dividing in the sense of this integral, but you have to think about what it means to divide a function by another function. And um, multiply with this relationship between the two. And this step is called smoothing. So these three together 
give us a general purpose algorithm for dealing with data sets. Uh, sorry, with, de with time series. And it consists of these three steps. If you have an infinite time series in front of you, you start by, uh, so you break it up into a, a, a recursion or an iterative procedure by first co somehow computing the posterior distribution over x t minus 1, given all the data up to t minus 1, then only locally predicting x t. That's the prediction step. Observing the local y t and updating with Bayes' theorem. Those two together are called filtering. And if at some point in the future you would like to have a joint full thing that takes care of the later data as well, because you need to go back in time, then you do an extra step called smoothing. And this is called an extra step because it involves the different types of kind of data structure. The first two, you can imagine, just like have constant memory requirement. You just keep around your local p of x t given y t minus 1 or y t. And then you never have to grow anything. It's just constant resource allocation. But if you want to be able to do this thing, you need to be, we need to keep around um, these objects. And well, actually, yeah, they are the same, right? So you have to keep around those objects. And uh, that means you have linearly growing memory requirements. But there are some applications where this is useful, in simulation, for example. OK, so that's the, now there's various ways of, of like representing this. I have now basically made the same slide again in gray. It just says what I just said. There are these three steps. You could also think of this as, an, as a pseudo code algorithm, if you like. So um, we are moving from left to right through the data to call this uh, filtering, and from right to left through the data to call this smoothing. Um, there's no point really much in, talk, in me talking about this. But what we need to do in the last 10 minutes is to observe that everything I've done so far just involves p of something. And I haven't really said yet what the p of something are. So there are basically two cases. Right? In general, this will involve an integral, and integrals are hard. So you can imagine that there are, prob there are probably just two cases in which this is going to be tractable. The first one is if the x's are discrete. Right? If, the, if x only takes 1 out of k values, if it's either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, OK. Right? That's called a hidden Markov model sometimes. Um, and it corresponds, actually, to large degrees to a finite automaton. It's just you're in a finite state. You get to observe something that's like an input of the world. And then your state changes in, in response. Interesting, but maybe also finitely interesting somehow. And the other, what is the other set setting going to be in which things are tractable if you have a continuous valued x? Yes, Gaussians. So the only other case in which we are just going to have tractable computation, typically, is if all of the p's are Gaussian distributions, but then we need something else. What was the trick that made everything tractable? It's not just Gaussian, but Gaussian and and linearly related, exactly. So we will need to make, like, to get to an algorithm that we can actually write in code and that you can write in your homework this week, we will need to make the assumption that the model is what's called linear Gaussian. Or there are actually various names for it. What's also often said is linear time invariant. These are these types of models. So where these two axioms, this one and this one, get not just written in this abstract p notation, but they explicitly are given a linear Gaussian form. Linear in the sense that the relationship between xi plus 1 and xi is through a linear relationship. So there's a matrix A that is always called A that is applied to xi. And then we add some Gaussian noise with covariance q. q is another one of these variables that has a fixed name. And then we make observations, just a moment, observations of y that are Gaussian around xi with a linear mapping applied to it called h, and some Gaussian noise with covariance r added. 
And if we assume that R and H and A and Q are just, very, just a fixed set of matrices that never change, they're just always the same, it's just four matrices to provide, then this system is called linear time invariant because A and Q and H and R do not change through time, so time invariant, LTI systems. And you may have heard of LTI systems before in some other place. The question is, is time invariance the same as being stationary in X? It's a bit more complicated. But uh, yeah, kind of. But I have to be, I need to have another five minutes to explain that. So if that's the case, then, and now here I'm going to move quite quickly because you can look at the slides afterwards, you can plug in Gaussian expressions into the equations that we had on the previous slide. So this first row here is Chapman Kolmogorov. It's the, the taking the step part. It's we have learned all the way to t minus one. Now we want to predict at time t. We look on the previous slide. We see that we have to do this. That's an integral. We plug in the two Gaussian distributions from the definition up here. By the way, of course, there's also an initial value. We sort of have to initialize at some point somehow. So the initial distribution is also Gaussian. Uh, so we plug this in. And then we just stare at this. And then you go back and say, ah, OK, now I have to open up lecture number five when we first got to see Gaussian distributions. Or was it six, maybe? And then there's going to be some property of Gaussians there. Ah, the product of two uh, Gaussian distributions is another Gaussian distribution. Or actually, this is, yeah, it's effectively an instance of a product of two Gaussian distributions. Or it's a, you know, the the posterior arising from a, con from a linear observation of Gaussian random variables. So you look it up, you find the right equation, you find that you can write the update like this. Uh, sorry, that's not called the update, it's called the prediction step. So we have now a prediction for uh, the state at time t, given all the previous data, that is a Gaussian distribution, and it has a mean and a variance, and those are typically given a name. They are called the prediction mean and covariance, the prediction distribution, and they're usually written with an M for mean and a minus up there for before the observation, and then a P. It's just a P. It's, that's the notation in this community. Don't ask me why. It's not a precision. It's a covariance. So it's not the inverse of a covariance. Now we need the update step. Well, the update step is actually really straightforward because it's just Gaussian inference. We have a local, local Gaussian distribution over xt. We make a local observation of xt in the form of yt by taking a linear map of xt, observing yt with noise r. And then you look up on the slide, at this big slide with all the properties of Gaussian distributions, what the update is. It's this. So it involves um, a matrix k, which has, of course, an inverse of a matrix in there, because there will be matrix inverses when we do Gaussian inference. And you can see that this maybe looks a little bit like those Guam matrices that you've seen for Gaussian process inference. And if, that's, if, you, if it seems like that, that's because it is. It's exactly the same kind of algorithm. It's just that it, the names of the variables tend to be chosen a bit differently. So people use to sort of another, like they kind of slice the equation in a different way to give it names. And then this k is called the gain. And there is a reason why it's called k, because it's the Kalman gain after Rudolf Kalman, a Hungarian mathematician. Um, yeah, and it's just Bayesian inference in Gaussian models. And then finally, we need to do this smoothing step backwards, which is associated not with Kalman, because Kalman was a signal processing person, and he would never have gone back in time. He needed something that works all the time, constantly. So some other people got to do the going back in time thing. And they are called Rauch and Tung and Striebel. And that's pretty much their entire claim to fame, except for Rauch, actually. He had a few other things. Um, and it's, again, just Gaussian algebra. So you can stare at this after the lecture. I don't have to do it now. Um, but there is another integral over the state that involves a ratio between Gaussians times the Gaussian. And you can convince yourself that means we need to update the, pre the estimation mean and estimation covariance using another thing that involves a matrix inverse that is called the Rauchtung-Striebel-Smoother, so another update. 
So in short, there's two algorithms that we need to implement that are actually things you can do on a computer rather than abstract mathematical objects. They are called the Kalman filter, and they look like this. So it's a for loop that starts at time zero and then all the time just moves through, makes a prediction step. So to predict, we compute m and p minus. Then we observe y. We compute the sufficient statistics called the residual, the um, innovation covariance, and the Kalman gain, and then update the mean and the covariance to get something without a minus. That's called the estimation mean and the estimation covariance. And you can also see maybe why, why k is so important, because it just shows up here. And then at the end, we just return all the m's and p's that we have computed so far. And if we don't want to store those, we just throw them away. And then the algorithm is constant time cost for each step and constant memory for each step, and therefore O of n. If we want to do smoothing afterwards, we shouldn't throw them away, because then we can't do smoothing. But if we keep them around, then the memory cost is also linear in time. And we can go back afterwards through this for loop and do these updates and compute the two um, uh, quantities that uh, define the so-called smoothed Gaussian estimate, which is another mean and another covariance called the smoothing mean and the smoothing covariance. And why do I show all of these to you? Because this is an instance where we're going to try and do you doing in the homework the basic exercise. This week's homework is to implement this algorithm as a for loop in Python using arrays and actual linear algebra. So um, I'll stop it here. So Markov chains are the archetype, the algebraic structure that we need to build algorithms that run with constant computational complexity through time. So that, therefore, the cost of doing inference is linear in the length of the time series. This is a fundamental property. It's not just for Kalman filtering or signal processing. It's a fundamental property of systems that have finite state. And they have deep philosophical implementation, uh, uh, implications and connections to physics and to finite automata and many other types of interesting models. But, and they give rise to this algorithmic structure called filtering and smoothing. If you want to implement those in practice, we need to make further assumptions about what the p's actually are, the probability distributions. If you assume that they are discrete, then it's just an array operation. And if you assume that they are Gaussian and the relationships are linear, we arrive at an algorithm called the Kalman filter and the Rauchtungstriebel smoother the, for the backward algorithm. And you can implement those methods. You can use this framework for tiny little things with five states or seven states or 42 states and build them in like tiny embedded systems that run in, in cars or in vacuum robots. Or you can use them on massive sets of weights of large language models across time, as we saw last week. And because everything can be made into a Gaussian distribution, if you really wanted to, you can use the same framework for all of these problems. And that's why it's a powerful notion to have in, the, in your toolbox. And on Thursday, so there's a, there's lots of books. This is the most recent one that might be fun to read. There's a new version of it, actually. And um, on Thursday, Nathanael will be here to tell you a little bit more about the deep underlying mathematics of these models and how you actually implement them for real-world problems if things are not quite linear and not quite Gaussian. Thank you. <laughs>